to um just integrate i'll let you know once it's connected okay, okay we're live okay um so hello everyone welcome to the let's talk event so how this event will work is that the first part of this event we will have the youth ambassadors ask a few questions each and then after that we will have a live some questions from the q a from the live q a on the youtube so why we're doing this event because Barbasa did a lot of research and it showed that a lot of young people are stressed and anxious about their future so we thought it would be a good opportunity for young people to talk to the mayor and have advice about the future. Okay, so now it's time to introduce the youth ambassadors. So maybe you just say your name and something about yourself. Rosie? Right, hello, I'm Rosie um, and I'm 19 years old. Um, I'm an apprentice for Bristol City Council, but I'm also um, a youth ambassador for Barbasa and I'm really excited to be here. Hi, my name's Hamza. I'm 16, an A-level student, and I'm also a Babasa Youth Ambassador. Hi, uh, I'm Hadi. I'm 17, also an A-level student at Redland Green, and I'm also a Babasa Youth Ambassador. Okay, now it's time to introduce the mayor, Marvin Lees. So Marvin, I'll let you say a little bit about yourself and introduce yourself. Oh, you're muted. I think you're on mute. Okay, yeah. Okay. So I've been mayor since um, 2016. Um, I ran in 2012 and lost. I ran again. Um, in terms of my background, you know, I'm more pretty brutal, I guess, in my description. I said I'm a mixed race kid from Eastern who grew up with an unmarried mum who grew on benefits. Um, and I say that because it's important to know for people to know that um, growing up in Bristol in a city that I didn't enjoy growing up in because of all the things you can there was still hope to be found out there, you know? And we made it happen. And I say we, because no one does it alone. Don't ever buy into this nonsense narrative that there are self-made people out there. Everyone stands on platforms. Some people stand on platforms of hundreds of thousands of pounds. And other people, you know, stand on platforms of friends and good mentors. And I had the uh, the latter. Um, yeah, and, and I, I think growing up the way I grew up, I just wanted the world to be fairer. I had a deep sense of things not being fair and I wanted to make it fairer. And that's what I do. And if we're perfectly straight about it, look, we're all fallen, imperfect human beings trying to work in broken institutions in a dysfunctional political economy. And we do our best to make good things happen in the face of that. And that's, that's our approach. And it means there'll be failure. Sometimes there'll be success. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. Okay, so now we're going to start with the first section of this event where we're going to let the youth ambassadors ask Marvin a few questions each. So if we start with Rosie. Hey, hello guys. Um, again, I'm Rosie. It's really nice to be here. And thank you again, Marvin, for coming. We really appreciate you taking time out of your evening to do this. Um, so I'm going to start off with the first question, really simple. Um, what does your normal day look like at the moment during lockdown? Ooh. <laughs> Sorry, Rosie, uh, my, I, I dropped out for a second then for some reason, if you no can problem. hear me. Um, so my yeah, question was, um, what does your day normally look like at the moment during lockdown? Uh, well, I spend, I work from home probably two, three, for three days a week now, only go in for a couple of days. Um, because obviously just trying to do like everyone else and stay at home when possible. So I've actually tried to change my daily clock. So I generally get up about quarter to six. Come down. Okay, I hope, can you still hear me? Can still hear you, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I hope it's an issue. Everyone's online at the moment. Um, come downstairs very early, do some reading, try and get through some emails. Then my kids get up and I try and get them launched on their schoolwork um, and then come back and plow on. And it's, at the moment is obviously a lot of communications around COVID. So we have a whole system set up that is pumping out information, making decisions. And I need, that needs to touch base with me. I then do my update videos to the city. Do
Might have cut out a little bit got then. Me. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Are you all dropping out as well, or is it just me? I'm not it's sure. Just... I don't know. <laughs> I think it's just you, Marvin, as far as can I'm aware. Can you hear me? Is... We can hear it's you now. It's just me. Okay. I, that's a bit frustrating, isn't it? It's been a nightmare all day. I'm on... I should divulge the name of my internet provider. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and so that's it. Um, and I with the MPs once a week, combined authority, other city leaders around the country. Um, we check into national government briefings. Um, yesterday, we had meetings on child safeguarding. We're really trying to get upstream of domestic violence, which we've seen an increase in um, with, uh, with the lockdown and the increasingly stressed positions. So, um, really focusing in, but in the background, we've got to keep the other, the normal course of events going, such as house building, you know, school places, and okay, do you want to ask your next question? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll make sure he's back. I'll just make sure he gets. I don't want to ask it if um, he can't hear me a second. But those are some really great answers, and we really appreciate that. It might have dropped off. <laughs> Again, possibly. Let's give it a minute and see if um, Marvin comes back. It looks like Is that Virgin Media? <laughs> <laughs> no, no names, guys. No names. No brands. No <laughs> one. We're like the BBC. You can't yeah. mention brands. <laughs> Sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hmm. I wonder if he's going to try and read. He's probably going to try and rejoin in a second. Probably, but in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> Rosie's providing the entertainment. I'll do a dance. <laughs> I'm not going to dance. I, um, I'm really bad at dancing. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm bad at dancing too. We can all be bad at dancing together. <laughs> oh, Rosie, you're so sweet. <laughs> Quite the charmer. <laughs> oh, ooh, here we go. He's back. Marvin's back. Let's see what happens now. Just waiting for him to come in. Yeah, sorry, guys. I don't know. I've just moved now right? like one meter from my router. So hopefully that makes a difference. <laughs> so perfect. Amazing. Um, would you like me to carry yeah, on with sure. the So, I was just saying, sorry, Rosie. No worries. I can think you hear me now? If he, yeah. Ask if he's done with his question, and if not, if you are, then you can move on to a second question. I'm going to try one more thing. I'm going to try one more thing here. I'm going to get off my Wi-Fi and see if it's better if I just go on my provider, my forward. That usually works for me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just talking the internet right now. I've taken my Wi-Fi off, and hopefully it's still working on the network now. So hopefully that'll be better. Perfect. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So sorry about that. <laughs> no worries at all. Um, did you have anything uh, to add for the last for the last question, or did you have to move on? No, it's just uh, just like everyone else will balance it. You know, we've got the variety of subjects we've taken on. We've made a big priority on food and hunger, domestic violence, child safeguarding, um, uh, getting the grants out to small businesses as well has been a real priority of ours, and communication so people aren't falling victim to the internet conspiracies and yeah. have a true picture of what's going on. All really, really important things. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Um, and the second question I had for you um, was, are there decisions that you've made prior to coronavirus that you think will have to change now? Um, well, yeah, clean, clean air zone is one that we're struggling with. Uh, and, you know, this is, this is where you have to be really careful about quick tweets and Facebook and, you know, one line, one line politics, which doesn't, you know, I was watching an interview with Obama the other day and he said one of his big grievances, or it might be in his wife's book, um, Michelle Obama's book, he, she says he doesn't like simplistic approaches to complicated issues. You know, we've got only 11% of businesses that employ between five and nine percent believe they can survive beyond 
six months of the current conditions, all right? Whatever, whichever way we cut it up, we got to deliver clean air. But at the same time, that does come at a financial price to businesses. So when people say, right, you've just got to do it, great. But are you willing to stand by the consequences of an additional financial burden on those businesses? Because when you're talking about five to nine employees, you're not talking about the big bad corporations that run airlines and then buy up your healthcare services. You're talking about somebody who owns a white van and does painting and decorating with a few other people, you know, small business. These are jobs, these are people put food on the table and I think the important thing when we do environmental issues is to take all that into account because you can't have environmentalism, uh, environmentalism written by invisible privilege. Michelle Obama talks about this, activism that is underwritten by invisible privilege because people can afford to take the financial hit of being involved which excludes working class people and people from poor backgrounds without taking their lifestyles into account. So we've got to hold economic hope hand in hand with everything else and it's not zero sum it's both ends. so what's the clean air zone government are saying this as well there has to be some flex about the way we implement it and the speed at which is uh, which is implemented so that will have to change Perfect. but Thank we you. still want to still deliver by 23 that's the aim <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much, Marvin. Um, I Thanks. think it's Hamza next for the next questions. Um, hi, my name's Hamza. It's nice to meet you. Um, hi. Hi. I'll jump right to my question: Is what are you doing to expand horizons and provide opportunities for young people now? And what do you plan to do after the current crisis? So, I, if I can do pre now as well, this has been a big thing of mine and so um you know I, I left school i got five c's at gcse i wasn't allowed to go to computer studies and chemistry i was a visionless lost young person you know i i had some talent i had some smarts but i didn't know what to do with it i had low self-esteem and all that so back in 2012 i set something up called the city leadership program and in fact now this the city leadership program graduates go on to a six-month mentoring with Abasa. And we identify high ability, high aspiration young people from backgrounds who are underrepresented in leadership, uh, be they come from poor, working class, migrants, uh, young women, disabled young people. And we give them two weeks of incredible input. Uh, Simon knew it. I used to facilitate it with Tracy Jolliffe. Then Simon knew it was chief executive of the record and Sherry Eugene from BCFM. And then we linked them up. So actually, I'll tell you a story. Um, Stephen, do you remember the story just um, last year about the young um, guy from um, Albania that the government were trying to deport when he finished at St. Mary Redcliffe? Stephen was one of our, our graduates. So I went out for lunch with Stephen. He stood out. I said, look, what do you want to do with your life? He said, I want to go in finance. I said, I know someone in finance. I made the introduction. Stephen's now on apprenticeship at Rowan Dodson, 16 grand a year. And when, he, when his court case came up, I wrote a letter because I was overseas, but everyone went down. So we've done that, you know. Um, I've got apprentice in the city council coming through the city leadership program as well. So I've always been about that, right? Um, but I would say there's a range of things we're doing now. One is tackling poverty and quality housing. All the stuff in the background that's not about education, but it's a context in which education takes place. These have been massively important to us. Mental health, personal health and social education, building affordable homes. Um, so, you know, when I was a kid, there was nowhere to do homework in our house. You know, so you know, I can remember trying to do this technical drawing piece of homework. I had nowhere to do it. You know, so my work was rubbish. And then I went on that downward spiral. You hand in rubbish work, you misbehave to cover up the embarrassment, and da 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 da. Um, so doing all that stuff in the the background. Um, but we've done a big drive on work experience as well. If you know Bristol Works. We, uh, we set that up. So over 50% of young people in Bristol were not getting access to work experience. I was one of those young people growing up. You know, I said I wanted to be a lawyer in school. No one ever said, and I said this to a teacher, no one ever said, oh, right, let's get you to visit a solicitor's firm. No one ever did that. So it was just something I said, and I found mildly embarrassing to say because at the same time as saying it and having a degree of confidence, I also carried a heavy dose of unconfidence that I was not worthy and able to step into those worlds. So work experience for us gives people that taste early doors. And we know 56% of kids weren't getting access to work experience. We know which 56% those were, right? Those whose uncle and aunts don't work at the BBC or don't work in the KPMGs or the PWCs and so forth. So we've, uh, we've driven in a lot on that. And I would say actually we're getting a lot of buy-in from business 
because one of the lessons at the moment is you cannot leave talent on the shelf. We're in one of the most socially immobile countries in, in the OECD, where it's your parental background is the biggest indicator of where you end up in life, not your talent and not your hard work, all right? That means that we leave millions of pounds worth of talent and creativity on the shelf every year. No economy can afford to do that now. And that's the case we're making. Do it because it's the right thing to do, drawing in people from a wider range of backgrounds, but that takes you so far. Do it because it's in your financial interest to do so. Um, and at, at risk of giving too long an answer, it's really worth reading um, McKinsey's report on diversity matters, because it's about getting poor, you know, they say that if you've got women in leadership, you're about 16% more likely to outperform the market. If you expand that to having BME people in leadership, that takes it up to about 28%. Why is that? It's because you're getting access to a diversity of thought. Mono thought, singular thought, rubs out creativity, innovation, and all the rest. Diversity of thought means you understand new markets, you can create the right products for new markets, and you can sell those products. And that's the case we've been making in the city. And I think there's an appetite for it. Oh, and we did a big piece on Channel 4 around as well. So I won't, but I won't go into that unless any one of you ask me that Channel 4 come here because they believed us about our commitment to inclusion and creating opportunities for young people from diverse backgrounds. Yeah. Um, thank you for your response. I think the last question is with Hadi now. Yeah, leading on from that, obviously, like you highlighted, know, young people, they faced issues before COVID and they, they continue to face issues like exams being cancelled and just the stress of being all at home. So, I just wanted to ask, what would your top three tips be for someone trying, a young person trying to be resilient right now? Ah, so we just, I just want to, in fact, um, I was talking with Anna Keane today because we had a cabinet, our cabinet leads for education and skills. Massive challenge for young people right now, particularly those in, in the final year of school, just missing out those last six years in GCSEs while trying to transition to college or, or employment without that pastoral support of the school around them, the structure. I... I don't know if I would have made that, you know? So we recognize this, the scale of the challenge right now. I would say um, to be resilient, don't try and do it alone, all right? Reach out to your friendship groups and share your experiences and your insights, right? If you don't have a good friendship group, and I didn't have a good friendship group at the end of my uh, school journey, please reach out to your, proactively reach out to your teachers and let them know you, are, you, are, you need support with the transition everyone needs support with transition. So don't even think that's a, a weakness, but you've got, to, um, you've got to reach out. Alongside that, um, you, can, you, know, you can reach out to my office because what, what we can begin doing is, you know, the more that comes in, the more we can kind of say, well, look, we've got a bunch of names here. What could we do? So it makes me think, maybe we could do something with Babasa. Maybe we could do something virtually or at City Hall in the fall, hopefully when the restrictions are lifted, in which we can offer some very practical and direct support for, to those young people, particularly who've gone through the, the transition um, from school to uh, you know, em employment that needing that extra support. And we can bring businesses and, and, and employers in, universities in, to say, right, how do we make up for that? You know, what's been missing for the last six months? Um, beyond that, just in general resilience, um, that, that's, a, that's a really tough one as well. Other than to say, you know, do not go down the rabbit hole of social media. I, I couldn't have survived social media and all that, right? You might need to touch base with it, but do not allow social media to give you an impression that everyone mm -hmm. else is living the way it's living, right? And, and, and again, reach out to us, reach out to city council, reach out to your schools for support whenever you feel you need it. And actually, hopefully before you feel you need it, you know, don't try and do it alone. Um, also, uh, just one last question. Um, how can other sort of young people help each other? And like, is there any support that's going to be made available for them to do that? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, stuff like this is young people helping each other. So I would say one of the things you could do directly is to have a conversation yourself about, we, we've developed a culture called Big Offer, Big Ask, right? If you yeah. want to make a big offer to young people in Bristol, right, that, that you understand what's going on and then say what that offer is you want to make, right? Then come to me and by, by extension, the rest of the city and say, we are a group of young people. 
we want to make this offer to young people in Bristol because this is what they're facing, right? And we can solve that challenge. But this is what we need from you as a city to enable us to, to, to make that offer, right? That way you're crafting it, you're designing it, you're leading it, and then you're challenging the city to back you to deliver it. Be that in mentoring, finance, access to organizations, access uh, to venues, whatever. So that might be one of the best things you can do is to design that intervention and then come to me and tell me what you need to do to, to be able to make that intervention offer real. Hey, thank you. I think that pretty much covers it. Okay. Um, I think now we're going to move into the Q&A section. And for the Q&A section, we, had, we don't think we have any time to be answering everyone's questions. So don't worry, we don't get upset or anything. We don't have any time to answer your question. Yeah, um, and I'm not strict on the time. I mean, we can go over a bit if you need to. It's not a problem. Um, so I have a question here on the chat, if you're ready to answer now. Um, yeah. So there's been one question, which is, um, there have been some positive environmental impacts as a result of COVID-19. Um, how will this impact how the city tackles climate change? Okay, so i say a couple of things. I do recognise the positive environmental impact. Um, economy slows down, um, you know, cleaner air. I just want to just say, I'm not saying you're saying this, but I, I, I've, I have been saying to people, I have an issue where I've heard kind of unqualified celebration of that environmental impact because the truth is it's the poorest people on the planet who are going to pay the highest price for that slowdown those are least able to afford it lost jobs and when this virus hits the global south it's going to decimate communities that don't have access to health so um, I, I have been in situations where I've heard people with lovely gardens saying oh it's fantastic just to hang around all day <laughs> well as the people are going to be unemployed um, some some economists are talking up to 20% unemployment, 50,000 people in Bristol, that would mean. That's horrific. Um, having said that, um, you know, as our economy begins to uh, contract, we said from the start that rebuilding the economy will not be real building what we had before. Um, and actually, I've just got off the phone uh, from uh, Mohammed Sadiq, who's the um, chief exec of Wessex Water, and we were just talking about um, how we can get a few brains together to think about the scale of reimagining the city that we could engage and begin to uh, to plan for. So we, we do need to uh, think about driving economic development through green infrastructure. And, and the biggest decisions we can make about our city sustainability is sustainable houses in the right places. Projects here and projects there don't work, but where we house tens of thousands of people, um, and how we house them will be the biggest determinant, determinant of our environmental impact. It gets no more romantic than that. Um, so we need to, we, we're going to start, obviously that's going to plan itself in. And actually the opportunity is to, to, to reinvent the economy so that it, it, as an economy, it is focused on carbon neutrality by 2030, tackling the ecological emergency, which is what we're doing. And we're having a seminar next week. I mentioned it earlier with a few brainy people from around the world. And one of the things we're doing is putting the sustainable development goals. If you haven't come across them, it's worth having a look. The global sustainable development goals um, at the center of our new economic recovery plan. Um, and that brings a whole bunch of discipline to what we do that is basically good for the, good for the planet. And, and I would say not extracting social just, uh, environmental justice from social justice, because sometimes people do, they cannot be separated. If people can't afford to put food on the table today, they're not thinking about existential threats, even in 10 years time. They're just worried about how they get through today. So we have to deliver um, jobs and, and freedom from poverty if we're serious about having a broad-based environmental movement that has the democratic legitimacy to ask for the inconveniences and behavior change uh, that we need to, to ask people to, um, uh, to, 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 to um, begin engaging in. Thank you. It's almost like you've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys, it's good. <laughs> um, I think there's another question as well. I don't know if one of you guys wanted to ask it um, or if I wanted to go ahead. Uh, is this the entrepreneurship one? In the chat, yeah. Yeah, yeah sorry. I'll, I'll ask that. And it sort of links to your last sort of answer. Uh, with that changing economy, obviously, like someone's just commented, 
the days of pensions of jobs for life are long gone. And uh, they're asking, can you give an overview of what sort of uh, opportunities to develop entrepreneurship young people have in uh, modern Britain? Sorry, the opportunities to develop entrepreneurship? Entrepreneur, yeah, yeah, in this changing economy. Okay. Well, I think that's, I mean, loads of things are up for grabs now. One is, I recognise that days of pensions. I don't have a pension. I mean, they took the pensions off people who were um, elected locally. So you do, I'm doing like the five years I do. And if I get re-elected more, well, none of it will be pension. So that's like eight years of life without having any contribution to a pension. You know, it's, just, it's, a, it's a brutal uh, world at the moment. My wife is self-employed as well. She doesn't have a pension. So we recognise it's a brutal world. Um, so, I mean, in terms of entrepreneurism, one of the points I've been making is that um, entrepreneurialism will be dependent somewhat on good mental health and well-being because you have to be able to fail and overcome. And I think sometimes that's missed and, and building up that sense of personal resilience. Um, and so one of my is, yes, we need academic smarts, but we need the, the um, mental, uh, emotional uh, personal development to go along to be seen as as important as that uh, that development. I mean, what well, I mean, what it took for Bill Gates to drop out of Harvard and just pursue his uh, uh, dream. I mean, that's like you know, I'd been too scared to do that, you know. So we see that as a as a key part in terms of the way the economy is. I I, I think there'll be massive challenges because the financial hit we're going to take. But at the same time, someone says in in times of economic downturn, money's looking for opportunity uh, to invest. And, you know, so many things will be in the air that potentially is the time for people to to step in. I just I'm just reading George Soros's book, who's known as the man who broke the Bank of England right, uh, for Black Monday back in the in the 90s. And his father came through the um, uh, was a Jewish Hungarian, uh, but su survived Nazism. But one of the phrases that he used was in times of turmoil, the impossible becomes possible. And Soros obviously went on to become an incredibly uh, wealthy man. I met him actually uh, last last summer. Um, and, and I think maybe for entrepreneurs, that's it. Not to allow the turmoil to deter you from thinking creatively about how you can step into this space. We need to get the economy moving. We need jobs that are green and sustainable. We need an economy that's inclusive. New models of business that actually uh, share the profits and inclusive and, and bring people through help us rebuild society we'll be looking for all of that and and i tell you there's something i tell activists all the time having been a you know an activist working on race equality some years ago if you just turn up moaning every day i guarantee you people will stop returning your phone calls and you'll only ever you'll only be able to communicate with them perhaps by tweeting at them right and then they may just pass over it if you turn up with solutions everyone will open their door to you and when i was working on race equality i said to my team we will point out the full ferocity of racism, right? But every time we do it, we'll turn up with a solution. And you know what happened? People start phoning us up. We got massive influence. Entrepreneurs turning up with solutions, they will be, I think they'll be open doors because we'll, we're gonna be in a unprecedented uh, time of social, political, economic turmoil uh, coming up. We're talking about the biggest public health crisis in a hundred years and the biggest financial hit since the Great Depression, since the Great Depression of 1929-32, right? This is this is a huge challenge. But as I said, with huge challenge, sometimes comes huge opportunity. No, uh, yeah, I think that's a great answer. And I think uh, there's truth to the fact that there's an opportunity even at the worst of crisis. Yeah, help us solve those challenges. You'll be, you know, <laughs> we'll bite your hand off. <laughs> There's another question um, here, if you've got the time. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. Uh, how are you planning on supporting underrepresented communities uh, with regards to youth in today's society specifically? For, for young people? So, yeah, so planning on supporting underrepresented communities, they've said, um, with regards to young yeah. people. So first off, I, I, I always, so this has been my stock and trade historically, right? I went into journalism because whenever you watch the BBC or whatever, it was always the same people talking about the same, you know, the different configurations of the same people on the same old questions. So I went into journalism to get hold of the voice of the voiceless, right? People didn't want to hear them when I was there. <laughs> so I ended up leaving. Uh, but 
That's why I went into BBC back in the day. And then coming into politics, I came in through a diversity program that targeted me as a young person in my 20s. May not seem young to you, but it seems young to me now. Uh, so I came in through Operation Black Vote, which was deliberately set up to get more black and Asian people involved in public life and gypsies, actually, and um, uh, Roma gypsy and so forth, communities they've been targeted as well. So I've come in, so I've benefited from that. And there's, there's a couple of things that need to happen. One is people need eyes to see, right? Um, they need to care or they need to see it's in their self-interest to deal with representation. Um, and then they need to do it on purpose, right? So first off, some people don't see it. They're like, I'm a nice person, right? I'm not going to say, but I went to a meeting the other day. Actually, this was a social justice, environmentally progressive meeting. I went last year. There was 150 people in a room in St. Paul's. Two of them were not white, and I was one of them. <laughs> and yet they were telling me they were the revolution. They were the embodiment of the change society needs. I said, they asked me what I thought. I said, well, I can tell you the truth. Oh, I can make you feel good. What do you want? <laughs> and I told them the truth. I said, this is an issue. You know, social justice movements don't get let off the hook because they claim to be doing good things if they're just going to recreate the whole uh, gender, race, class hierarchies in a new model of leadership. That's what got us into this social and environmental mess, right? Posh people making all the rules. So, um, so you got to see it first, right? Secondly, you, you know, you have to, you, you either have to care or you have to see it's in your self-interest. We go back to the issue of diversity earlier on and diversity of thought. If you care about it, you do it because it's the right thing. You do it in your self-interest because you know it brings you greater le legitimate economic legitimacy and so forth. And then it doesn't happen by accident. So uh, um, last year, myself and Asher noticed that the magistracy were recruiting 60 people to sit on the benches, right? And the criminal justice system is a is a fork in the road for lots of young people, right? Well, my friends, number went to prison, went the wrong road. I went the right way and all that, right? Um, so me and Asher filled City Hall with about 70 Black, Asian, Middle Eastern people. And we said, let's, some of you got to apply for the magistracy. Some people say, it's not for me. We say, well, maybe it's not about you. Maybe it's about putting your skills at the service of the city and transforming, you know, a, a, you know, a sector. So uh, long as I say, we're doing it on purpose. And that extends down to young people. So when we talk about work experience, as I did at the beginning, that's people who don't get access to work experience. When we bid for Channel 4, and, and the head of Channel 4 in Bristol will tell you this, everyone went to Channel 4 and said, oh, please come to our city. Please come to Leeds, Liverpool, Manchester, Birmingham. We said to Channel 4, we'd love you to come to Bristol, but only if coming to Bristol and get, uh, you, by you coming to Bristol, we would bring greater diversity to our creative sector. More young people from a wider range of backgrounds getting, getting jobs and money and mortgages and pensions and all the rest of it, right? Because it's not just about feeling good. You've got to pay the bills, right? Give some money to your parents. Take care of your sisters and brothers if you're if you, the one who earns the money. If you come. Channel 4 took that seriously. And they'll say that's one of the reasons. That's what made them sit up because everyone else asked them to come. We said, no, it's conditional. Help us do something. So we, we've done that for young people, and we're, you know, and that's what we'll, we'll we, you know, we'll continue to do. I hope I didn't meander too much there, but just that, no, that's perfect. I think my computer froze a little bit, so I was just worried I was going to lose you, but I've got you back now. Um, so I think we've got a few more questions. If you've still got some time from hands up, possibly. Sure, go ahead. Yep. Um, so with regards to youth in today's society, what techniques would you suggest or have worked in the past to ensure a healthy work life balance? Oh, well, I've never got on top of that, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> never. Um, I, I tell you what, if I went back in time, right, and started my life again at your age, I would carve out maybe two or three hours a week to read uh, biographies of, of successful people. And by successful, I don't mean they just made loads of money, but people you admire, because you'll learn about their life habits, right? Um, and I would probably even pick up books like Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, How to Influence and Influence People, Getting Things Done. There were these books that just give you techniques that if you pick them up at your age and start to practice them, they become habits that you don't even think about. And what they would do is give you good habits. So there's nothing more boring than, than someone who the only thing they do is work much more interesting to someone to say, oh yeah, I'm working today, but 
you know, two weeks ago I was climbing Ben Nevis or I was snowboarding or I was wild swimming or, you know, these people will, will talk to you about that. Right. Um, and I would probably say, you know, make sure you, you know, have yourself a passion, have yourself a non-work hobby. I used to play a lot of rugby, used to box and, and then I went, I used to go to the gym a lot. Um, I've got children now and that's all disappeared. I got to live my fantasy through my kids. <laughs> my, I used to watch rugby special and think, oh, I might go and play professional rugby one day. Now I'm like too old for that, you know. <laughs> so make like sure you got, kids, <laughs> yeah, yeah, make sure you have a little passion off to the side and protect that passion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that that habit. But invest now in some of them life habits that you'll carry for the next thirty years. And uh, let me tell you something, right? Because I wish I'd done it. Open up a pension now, right? Compound interest. Start just putting five pound a month into your pension, right? Compound, you know, compound interest works. Yeah, just do it five uh-huh. pound a month and then start building it up. <laughs> and when you're 50, you'll thank me. <laughs> well um, yeah. I think Nehanda has one more question for you. Um, yeah, um, let me find okay. COVID 19 is telling us self sufficiently is, is vital for the future its future and your self-determination. How can the city work with families to develop new skills in agriculture and growing their own? So we are in our planning, future planning for Bristol, you know, we've got to build these, we've got to build like 30,000 homes, right? Because the city's got, you're growing, right? You're going to want homes. City's going to grow by 100,000 people over the next um, 25 years. We've got a housing crisis today. If we don't build homes for people, yeah, what city are you going to be in in, in, in 10 years' time, right? Um, so we've got to build homes. But what we are doing as we are planning how we build those homes and where we put them is we are building in food growing uh, within, to, it, within that. Because you're right, we do have to look at this issue of uh, local sustainability and resilience. So it, within a scheme we're a part of called Going for Gold and Spatial Planning, we're thinking about how can we build uh, 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 land in. In fact, we, we just had this conversation. I was on a phone call with um, with Southwest, a load of council leaders from all across the Southwest, stretching down to, to Land's End and Dorset, I think, as well, even. And one of the things I raised with them was that as a city that places a lot of demand for food, we would love to build a stronger connectivity with Somerset, Devon, Cornwall, and source our food locally to reduce miles, but also then we can begin investing in that that local regional um, economy as well. So we're trying to bring food a lot closer, uh, closer to the point of consumption all the time. But one of our challenges is that we are in the middle of a global food system that doesn't do that. It's one of the challenges we have to take on that I've been praising, that the way cities and global systems have developed, they've had no mind to the planet. So if you care about the planet, you have to be conscious, do something about it, inconvenience yourself and pay more, right? What we need to do, I believe over the next 20, 25 years, and I'm just talking about this with a potential investor just now, is we need a 20, 25 year plan for our city and not just our city, others, that allows us to totally transform the way it runs, right? And that means rebuilding waste systems, energy systems, so that a low impact life is just what you do. And actually, if you want to destroy the planet, you have to inconvenience yourself and pay more to do it. So we're trying to get on top of our systems to to make their low impact life just what you do. A little little example of that is biogas buses. When you get in a biogas bus, you don't think, oh, I'm on a gas bus. Well, you made it first time. You're just catching the bus. But now you're not catching a diesel bus. And we're just making that making that easier. But that's going to take a lot of money, a lot of finance to do. But we're trying to line that up. Yeah, I think we have just two questions left. So um, obviously Bristol, known for the arts, but um, as a result of coronavirus, obviously a lot of theatres and places like that have shut down. Uh, What would you say specifically for that industry? What are the opportunities for young people there in that industry specifically? Yeah, I mean, to be frank, it's brutal right now. Um, And I've just shared with you the scale of the economic challenge we, we, you know, we're potentially facing. The yeah. creative sector is being just bashed because it depends on bringing people together and and it potentially could be the slowest to one of the slowest to recover because 
there'll be a lag of trust amongst the population as well. Is it safe for me to go to a play and sit next to someone? There are all these social habits that we'd have picked up over the lockdown that we're going to take time to uh, time to break out of. Um, and, you know, it won't be like we just switched off the you know power and then we just switch it back on and carry on before. The, the financial devastation is going to be huge, which is why we've really tried hard to get our money out the door. Um, I, I can't say other than what we are really trying to do is that's why I, I just say we've got to create the conditions for economic development. And I use that term because I know some people struggle with growth, but the economy does need to be bigger to provide jobs. It just depends on what kind of economy, what kind of bigger it is. If it's a diesel CO2 bigger, that's obviously not that great. If it's a green bigger, you know, sustainable bigger, then, you know, that's a more inclusive, then that's what we want. But by getting the economy going, uh, by providing jobs, by supporting people to start their businesses again, then they will have the money to live a life in which they can go to the theater, can, you know, it, you know, engage in the arts. There's no shortcut to that, really, I don't think. I think we have the last question from Rosie. Yeah, so final question. Um, again, thank you so much for taking your time out your evening to come and do this. We've really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed it, definitely. I don't know about these guys, but um, yeah, no, no, it's been great. Um, and so the final question is, uh, what would you say to all the young people out there right now who are worried about themselves and their future? So I would say it's perfectly natural to be worried about yourselves and your future. It is not a strange thing to be doing. It is, if you weren't worried about yourselves and your future, I'd find that strange right now, right? So one is, don't think it's odd. Secondly, know that, you're, that there are lots of people in the, the same situation, right? Um, so in that sense, we just want people to know you are not alone, right? The third thing is, I'd say, there are lots of other people who are worried about your future. And because we are worried about your future, we want to do something about it to support you. What we're not claiming is that it's going to be easy or that we have the answers on the back of an envelope, right? But there are people, if we know what you need from us, which is what we talked about at the beginning, Hedy, I think, we said, come up with a, the intervention and tell the city what you need from us. If we know what you need from us, it makes it much easier for us to deliver that than us sitting in the back room with a bunch of people in their 40s, 50s and 60s trying to work out what young people need and then, and then, and then serve it up. So there are, there are people who are ready to engage with you with, with some solutions. But it, it's going to be a challenge in time. There's a, there's a proverb, if I can just share with you, that I, I use a lot. Look, I'll be frank with you, again, my background. Um, and, I sh and I share this not as any woe is me, but just because I think sometimes it's important to share so people know there's hope, right? So I grew up with my mum, white woman, unmarried, with a brown baby on her way in 1972. If you know anything about that era, right, white woman, unmarried, with a brown baby, shouldn't have, have that baby. So before I was born, my mum come under pressure to have me aborted, right? And then when I came out of the womb, uh, some of the first conversations was if she was a good woman, she would give me up for adoption, right? Now, those circumstances followed me through my life, right? They didn't just disappear. We lived in a refuge when I was two. My dad was violent. Um, so we, I kind of lived feeling kind of insecure in my homes. I got seven brothers and sisters, only one with my mum, but, you know, we're, tight, we're tight as a, um, siblings and so forth, you know. And then, um, you know, I lived in a house with an electric meter, when the 50p used to drop, the electric would turn off. And if you didn't have 50p, you went to bed because uh, even if it was 7.30, because you didn't have any more electricity, you know, we lived that. And, and one of the things I learned uh, was that there's a proverb I use, suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character and character, hope, right? No one likes suffering when you're going through it, right? But if you can get the wherewithal and the support to get through it, you will, you will, understand what it means to persevere right when you've understood what it means to persevere you will develop a character right and that character will underpin you for life right so me now i get i get the kind of you know excuse my categorizations but the angry middle class <laughs> you know so far it's just on me at twitter all the time and all that people say does that bother you i said i had worse as a kid <laughs> You think that that, you know, toothless mauling I get you know, bothers me? I've been through worse, right? And, and, and while, like I said, I'm not making light of suffering. I, w I wish I hadn't gone through what I went through as a kid, right? But having looked back on it, it, you know, it will give you a strength um, if you can, if you can uh, get through it. And, if, and just indulge. 
My favorite, one of my favorite films of all time is Goodwill Hunting. Have you seen Goodwill Hunting? I get some not. You must watch it. <laughs> it's about a kid who comes from a poor background who's a genius, but he says to a rich kid in a bar once, he says, "Your, your parents dropped 150 grand for an education you could have got for a buck fifty in, in late charges at the public library." All right? If I'd known, I said to him, "If I'd known at 18, at 18, what I know now, I'd have been a lot more confident." Because when I got to university with all the rich kids and I felt inferior, I said, well, your parents spent 350 grand on your education. You're at the same university as me. <laughs> so I've done better than you. As a mayor of Bristol today, when I turn up and I sit around a table with these millionaires, I'm still the shaved head kid who grew up in Eastern. My mum still lives on the same road we moved to in 78. And I'm sitting at the table with you. So pound for pound, I'm not saying I'm better than you, but I've come further. And that gives me a right to be here, not to feel inferior. So look at all these, keep a journal write down what you're learning turn it into the positive but that takes a conscious mindset to turn your adversity into lessons for life but i i say it's not easy and i'm not making light of suffering but i promise you if you can if you can look for the lessons in the challenges that you're going to be facing those lessons will be with you for life and they'll become a source of your power in the future yeah? amazing thank you so much that's great all right thank you for all the questions from the youth busters and from the people watching the live. Um, big thank you to Marvin, Rosie, Hadley and Hamza for participating in this event. And also what to say, if any young people would like to join Babasa, then you can do so by contacting them on their website at babasa.com and also all socials at Babasa Hub. You can also contact Provania at 07 Three seven six four two eight eight one seven, and also like to say that Babasa has launched a their hashtag Beyond COVID appeal. If you can donate a little as twenty five pounds, mean means a casework can deliver a one to one session for a young person, as it's quite hard during this time. There's also details below, and that'll be it. Congratulations on your Queen's Award, Babasa. <laughs> All right, thank you for coming Marvin it was really great All having right. you here and um, I think I'm going to appreciate that uh, thank you. no problem thank you so yeah, much, much. Yeah, just so much re appreciate. reach out whenever reach out whenever we're here right yeah. definitely thank you so much